Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching and or listening to this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be covering the entire Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins in the style of Plutarch's Lives. So we will go through each chapter, um, doing a brief biography of each respective article author and then into a brief overview of each of their respective chapters and then at following both biographies and chapters we will have comparisons at the end to hopefully learn a little bit more about them. This I think is a particularly important video because the second chapter is by Christopher Tomlins who is one of the editors of the handbook and furthermore he's had a large contribution in the work of a lot of the other authors in their chapter and as if you have seen or listened to some of the previous or perhaps likely future um, videos or chapters there's a lot of references as well to Christopher Tomlin so although this is his chapter itself he's also has a lot of representation as well and also this is a very fascinating chapter as well by Tom Johnson the two chapters are titled Legal History and the Material Turn by Tom Johnson and Marxist Legal History by Christopher Tomlins. So I would like to first point out, this is not a, a video that will necessarily give a full or complete definition of the materialism or the material turn or Marxism, but rather how they relate to legal history. So hopefully you have some sort of idea as to what these two things are, but nonetheless, I'll try to hopefully explain it as we go through. So without further ado, we will begin with the chapter and biography of Tom Johnson. So Tom Johnson's chapter is in part three of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, Perspectives Legal History in Modern Legal Thought. His chapter is chapter 27, Legal History and the Material Turn. So uh, as, as for his brief biography, he's a senior lecturer of history at the University of York focusing on late medieval history. He, in terms of his academic career, he read history at Cambridge, completing his degree in 2010. He later received a master's in at Oxford in 2011, and he received his PhD at Birkbeck University of London in 2014, with his thesis, Law, Science, and Local Knowledge in Late Medieval, oh, pardon me, Law, Space, and Local Knowledge in Late Medieval England under the supervision of John Arnold. He spent a year in academic by employment for an American exchange program and translating Latin. And in 2015, he was elected to a junior research fellowship at Emmanuel College, Cambridge. In 2016, he came to the University of York as a lecturer in late medieval history and he has since continued in that position. His research interests include law, governments and authority, church courts and ecclesiastical institutions, and news, information and rumor, and also materiality, which will be the primary subject of this chapter. However, he will also take a, use many of his examples from medieval studies as well. He has written chapters in, on culture and materiality and as well articles such as the byland revisited or specters of inheritance in the journal of medieval history published in 2021 another article news and networks published in a cultural history of media in the middle ages from 500 to 1450 published uh, with the editor uh, Symes c published by the bloomsbury publishing in 2021 as well, another article he wrote was Soothsayers, Legal Culture and Politics of Truth in Late Medieval England, published in the Culture and Science Social History Journal of the Social History Society in 2020. He also has a forthcoming book titled uh, Law and Legal Ideas, or covering law and legal ideas used in everyday life in the 15th century England, and with the focus to better understand this period of dramatic social, cultural, and political transformation. I was not yet able to locate the title for this, so if you're interested in his work or interested in what he will be up to, I encourage you to find its title as well. So 
moving to the chapter itself once again this is in part three perspectives legal history in modern legal thought chapter 27 legal history and the material term so in terms of his introduction he says this chapter considers the implications of the material term in the humanities and social sciences for the study and writing of legal history so specifically in the context of legal history the material turn here is defined as the recent surge of scholarship that turned a critical gaze on both physical objects and materiality. On the one hand, it entails a focus on constitutive role of material things in human society and culture, and on the other hand, it's an interrogation of material as a category of analysis with particular emphasis on deconstruction of this category. So that's how we define or how he defines material turn for the context of legal history. So we'll um, clarify this further. He, and legal scholars, he notes, in several disciplines have contributed to this turn and have begun to explore, uh, beginning to explore the application to study of law as well as applied concepts as well, such as government, punishment, and sovereignty. So this material turn has not only affected legal history, but also government, uh, punishment, and sovereignty, and among other things as well. He says, although relatively few legal historians have incorporated in their work, many yet, uh, there may yet have significant implications for the way we think about and write. So there are still likely many opportunities for this material term, um, how we write history of the law. So this chapter, as it follows, will have some potential, intersection, um, potential intersections at which these two fields converge, that being the material term and legal history. At first, as an exploratory forways have shown, legal historians will certainly enrich their analysis by considering the role of things more carefully and more and by including more radically theoretical approaches to materiality itself. Ex there will be exciting opportunity to rethink the very phenomenon of law in past societies. As in the second place, the legal historical perspective, with an emphasis on change over time and well-developed capacity for technical analysis in relation to historical evidence, will help enrich on the ongoing turn in legal studies, a point to a new avenues for research. And third, in the third place, we will trace the genealogies of broader intellectual trajectories that led to the sharper identifiable turn in the 20th century and early 21st century and subsequently suggest three paths forward, paths forward for legal historians to incorporate insights in research. And these three categories are categorizing, which is the possibility of redrawing ontological categories, for example, object and human, to open new ways of understanding law in the past. The second approach, materializing, which looks at an analytical approach in which law under, is understood as a phenomenon of material things it draws unto itself and the third approach being filing which looks at materiality of legal systems both through processes of record creation and performative praxis focusing attention on the co-constitutive co nature of law and its material bureaucratic apparatus apparatus and as we'll see and no spoilers but the filing seems to be Tom Johnson's favorite of the three approaches. And once again, the three approaches which we will be covering are firstly, categorizing, secondly, materializing, and thirdly, filing. He notes these three approaches and monikers accrue, ha, are accorded, but are not schools of thought, but rather various emphases within the theoretical approaches to materiality. And he will also suggest in each approach historical examples drawing from his own expertise in law and society of medieval England, and as well a critique of each, and uh, also a pro uh, progression of uh, materiality as a whole, and in following a, a conclusion, he will have a short summary of the analytical benefits to be gained by pursuing all three avenues. But as I said, no spoilers, I think he does favor the third, that being filing. But there is obviously, and clearly, as he will show, benefits and implications of the former two as well. So moving to section two, it's titled, that was the introduction, it's titled, Materi um, he, he opens with the, um, there's no titles of his section, so he, oh, but he opens with the uh, quote, 
The material turn in humanity seems to fit with the broader trends in contemporary society. Its focus on the power of the material world seems very, uh, uh, seems highly fitting in an era of burgeoning environmental destruction. Its terminology of networks and flows seems apposite for the information age. Its destruction of categorical divisions between humans and objects mirrors the breaking down of these boundaries in bioengineering. So there's these broader humanities trends that seem to fit with this material turn. He says, if to live, the more, uh, more obvious explanation in history now that fully rounded the earlier cultural turn, uh, which Caroline Bynum in her perspective connections and objects what's happening now so this material turn seems to be following this cultural turn therefore a new cultural history with a focus on texts meaning culture and discourse mirrored in critical legal studies and the proliferation of law and society histories faded with familiarity and routine so this after this cultural history we seem to be having this material turn according to Tom Johnson, and we've had actually many discussions about this cultural turn, which could be seen as perhaps sociological jurisprudence, which is a chapter previously covered. Therefore, the material world seems to offer something much more tangible as a focal point of analysis, and the historical trends, such as history of the body and history of emotions, sought more beyond discourse as a main object of historical concern. So this material turn seems to be the next, or the cure, perhaps, to some of the issues that were evident in the cultural turn. And part of a longer trajectory, this material turn is the, of the post-structuralist critique. For example, the term madness, the new cultural historians um, uh, classify as a, a simplify, have simplified as materialism perspective as a much more of a construct of a, as a disease itself rather than um, two separate things such as the symptom and the social effect whereas in materialism it seems to unite the two so then he says if the if new it's if not new if the material turn is not new it, it nonetheless developed from two sources one the various strands of michael foucault's thought most uh, who's one of the most important founding of the norm of biopolitics in those lectures at the College of France from 1978 to 1980. And he also founded on a historical thesis in the 17th and 18th century saw the erasure of traditional political sovereignty exercised by rulers over uh, subjects. And therefore with political economy and or reason the tap the reason for the state Governments increasingly attempt to manage phenomenon such as health, hygiene, birth rate, life expectancy, and race, and there have been radical implications on modern uh, liberals. So this is all part of Michael Foucault's influence, but as we see, it might have caused or been an uh, um, earlier manifestation of the mere to turn. Um, he saw governments were equal to a recursive uh, use a recursive exercise to mold and molded by subjects. So it's kind of back and forth. They do mold the subjects, but the subjects mold the government as well, which is one of Foucault's findings. And therefore, there's a positive means of coercion as well as a willingness to be governed. The second source, or the earlier manifestation perhaps of the material turn that Tom Johnson notes, is from Bruno Latour, who evolved out of the quintessentially pro post-structuralist pr project, where there was a creation of scientific law, not revealed, but produced, and it was highly contingent on historical and social circumstances. Therefore, it stuck to explaining the material world as a social construct and society in terms of the material world, and attempts to cut the Gordian knot by destroying the distinction between natural and social objects, and therefore there was no pre-existing society. And it was hugely liberating as the sociology of association, both humans and non-humans, or actors exercising agency through the actor network theory. So this Bruno Latour in some ways combined both actors, humans, and non-humans into one sort of material thing. So when, he, when this material turn is, in my mind, it's not identifying materials themselves, but it's materializing the non-material.
That would be one way I would define it, but it's, you would take books to define it. And that's not the main focus of this chapter anyways. Um, it, and therefore it affected the materialist approaches to a diverse range of disciplines such as philosophy, speculative realism, and folds in ge and it folds into the in genealogy of Heidegger, um, uh, Merlefort, and Deleuze, as well as in Jane Bennett's political economy of things, there's a liter and the literary scholars they disenchanted with discourse, where uh, so a lot of literary scholars were disenchanted with discourse, and like historians, the Latorian critique offers an escape from the world of pure text and a re-examination of nature of representation. So now he will turn to the application to the legal uh, hist history. Um, uh, that is the material turns effects on the material uh, legal history. So, but to, to sum up, there is these two uh, intellectuals who perhaps manifested the material turn even before the material turn was later defined it, defined post the cultural turn. So, moving to section three. He says, it is hopefully uncontroversial to state that the law is intimately related to its categories. The, uh, um, a, there was a great medieval legal historian, S.F.C. Milson, who said, the categories which lawyers classify life exists even in a customary system, in a custom system. And interrogation, therefore, interrogation of ways formulated in different societies and reasoned in such ways and boundaries drawn must be central task for legal history. So Tom Johnson, and according to this also Milsom, a great legal historian, uh, the categorizing is an essential or central task of legal history itself, and therefore this has to imply as well into the material turn as well. Therefore, it's not new and may push up against some of the most entrenched boundaries, such as people versus animals and artificial versus natural objects. And as I said, the material turn seems to unite these. And if the categorizing is the key or one of the central elements of legal history, then there would seem to be a, a, a conflict here. Therefore, he, he has this approach called categorizing as a mode of legal historical analysis can help understand how law has been used to construct and police the boundaries in past society. So this is the first of the three approaches we'll be discussing. That is, once again, categorizing, materializing, and filing. So with the start, so starting with the categorizing example, he starts with a historical example where the links between legal and and more philosophical distinctions were made extremely explicit. So in a work called Bracton, uh, in the 13th century, which was a 13th century treatise attempted to squeeze into English law Roman categories, um, and it was named after Henry de Bracton, who was a leading Roman law scholar in the United Kingdom. And he also had, was heavily influenced on the idea of mens rea, which is and the distinction between actus rea, the intention, and the action itself. And, um, and therefore, he said it was, uh, in terms of the categorizing, he said it was possible to distinguish things, or res, um, uh, as well. And I think the actus rea and mens rea is a form of categorizing itself, so also in alignment. So, but... Nonetheless, there was ways to distinguish criminal intent in three ways. One, it could, or um, could, uh, or, or sorry, it's way to distinguish things, which are re's. Re's are all things in three ways. Could they be owned or not? Are they corporal or incorporeal? Are they physical or not? And are is the use common to all or used by the community um, or called universities? or by an individual. So these are the ways that you could define all things. So basically, could, is there ownership possible? Is it physical? And is it common to all? And therefore, useful for a corporeal animal and incorporeal right, for example, to drive out the price of a piece of land. And there was, um, but it was less useful. So, for example, defining an animal was easy, or the right to a land piece of land. It can be owned. And it's easy and it's tangible. But it's less useful in the problem, in problem cases such as smoke, 
is it it can it cannot be touched but it can affect other people like a secondhand smoke and a, air are incorporeal but they um, and he also notes that um, air is one of the four elements in all bodies this is one of the old elements created from uh, uh, um, that all bodies are so there's also air in a person so can you and can you own do you own your own air probably perhaps but then like if some secondhand smoke i think is one of the he doesn't necessarily reference that but i think would be a good uh, uh, way of manifesting or elucidating this but so nonetheless these definitions start to get difficult in the gray areas no pun intended and they melt away into scientific ideas about the composition of the world and then furthermore he also has the uses a lighthouse example so it is a building and the property is tangible but the light itself cannot be and it's impossible to restrict from third-party use so this categorizing is and then leading into materiality as we'll see is there's a lot of there's gray areas so what is a thing it's almost impossible to have a specific thing or a thing or or it's impossible to categorize everything so therefore the ontological status of slaves furthermore such as in the Caribbean and United States in the 19th century debate, were they persons or things as well, leads into this categorizing debate. And therefore, the focus on discourses of discursive categories undermines discourses themselves for, two, for, for multiple reasons, including one, that it excludes any critical scrutiny of materiality itself and instead offers only lukewarm inquiry of representations. Two, if it remains at this level of discourse, law merely means categorizing of the world and fail to properly scrutinize its claim to be able to categorize and in turn its ontological status of discourse. So it's kind of self-defeating its, and therefore law a priori excluded from the material. Nick Bloomley, uh, who is in his groundbreaking work of 1966, said exclusion profoundly ideological with many consequences for understanding the law and legal history since must consider under what circumstances law dematerialized and how justified and to what extent therefore he says when we begin to study law as a part a part of the material world which it seems which it seems to dis delineate we can begin to perform other kinds of legal historical analysis altogether. So I think the main takeaway here is this categorizing is a very important thing, but we do not move beyond the level of discourse. We cannot actually get into the discussion of law itself. So this moves to section four, um, and he says, this leads us directly into the second avenue of inquiry, which the author dubbed materializing, Tom Johnson dubbed materializing. So, the genealogy is distinct from those discussed above, and it's largely from the spatial term, so not from the cultural term, in the humanities in the 1990s. So this second approach is from this the spatial turn of the 1990s, and it's spurred by, among others, English publication of Lefebvre's The Production of Space in 1991. Initially, scholars began to think of ways law compli was complicated by space. For example, Richard Ford in 19, his 1999 article, Compelling and Hopelessly Arbitrary Boundaries That Lie Behind Legal Paradox of Territorial Jurisdiction, and followed up by the interest in sanctuaries, such as places that are um, uh, conditionally exempt from secular criminal jurisdiction in the Western Middle Ages. So the analysis of law and space developed into a more sustained critical engagement called legal geography. Therefore, doing law in geography shapes the understanding of how law shapes the physical condition and legitimates spatiality. And law has a physical pr presence or even many presences. It solves the categorizing riddle because it refuses to grant legal status, a separate ontological status above and apart from the world it categorizes. For understanding how weird this was historically, early complex politic polities, such as um, Adam T. Smith analyzed uh, in his classic period Maya, 
in his classic covering the the Mayan, uh, where he analyzed um, cl classical Mayan period and the kingdom of Yurata, Yurutu, imagined the authority of sovereignty as fundamentally spatial as opposed to a discursive phenomenon. Therefore, beyond the con conceptual reorientation, if law has a physical form, what forms might it take? It cannot be touched, but it touches everything, it seems. So, for example, speed limits are not necessarily a material thing. However, a legal geographer termed these non the nomosphere as a pervasive spatiality of law. So, for example, the speed limit is not a material thing, as one would, or not a tangible thing, but it does affect the material world. He then moves to his medieval example uh, from Nick Blom Bloomley in making private property, enclosure, common right, and the work of hedges in the rural history, um, published in 2007 where hedges in early modern rural England were a symbol of enclosure carried through the threat of the Lord's legal claim, therefore um, separating it from private, private from communal property. They could be broken, and therefore law could be undone, and law enforced if broken. Um, therefore, there were debates on the ground as to part of the legal discourse. So nonetheless, there, these hedges don't really stop anyone from moving, but they really kind of manifest its the existence of these boundaries. So sound laws, for example, um, uh, in nightclubs you cannot have loud sound too loud or for x y distance, x sound at y distance, so these are not physical things but they have material consequences. Pepper spray and electric shocks, um, they don't necessarily leave physical marks but they do have material effects. Uh, even if they're just held and there's a deterrence effect similar to that of the hedges. And these are all considered in the nomospheric approach to legal history. And also in the materializing approach, generally. His own research in medieval English law of shipwrecks and objects responsible for homicide, where objects were, um, there was absorption of particular objects. So for example, it was a shipwreck and then it shows up in a certain country and then it becomes identified as, for example, an American or British object, but it came out of nowhere, but it becomes material from, from out of nowhere. Um, but there are two major problems with this materialist approach. One, as Tim Ongold, Ingold pointed out, in naming material precisely ontological partition out is out there and versus in here is pur it's purporting to refute so therefore it it still has some things that do, are not defined as material so it doesn't really encompass everything even though it encompasses most things and broads and the material uh, materialism or material turn it does not encompass everything so what may be expedient for a particular history such as enclosures or deodads might not be for others such as history of trusts the second problem is if law is already was always already there how does it achieve its purpose therefore not it's not an objection but an invitation he references christopher tomlins who is the author of the next chapter and he who had the same problem in differentiating law from from its context where he said it was too protein to be demarcated and, is, and therefore his analysis that locates it everywhere begins to suffer categorical collapse. So then on the other hand, if law is everywhere, then is it even a category? <clears throat> Pardon me. Therefore, the materialized law takes us closer to power, authority, and the promulgation, and thus away from rules, procedures, and administration. Then we move to the next section to look at how these focal points can be brought closer to a different approach to the materiality of law, which is the third avenue of inquiry. Here he titles filing, which is the most heterogeneous, he says. It draws in a rather artificial manner a disparate body of scholarship which focuses on paper, paperwork, and it will work literally done on paper. No attempt here will be made here to draw out a conceptual genealogy, unlike the previous two, and its novel and perhaps the newest approach of the three. Uh, 
to, or the newest approach to understand the relationship between law and materiality. So yes, the newest of the three. And it, therefore, it is an attempt to understand the physical composition of text and how actors derive phenomenon called law from so much paperwork. A strength of this approach is that it offers an ethnographic account of law's materiality, focusing on 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 the role of physical things within the domains of social actors understood as legal. So the benefits, one, it overcomes the problem of categorizing, that it does not provide discourse any prior ontological status, and it owes much to the tour's actor network theory. And law is epiphenomenal, emerging from a mass of human documentary movements in and around the landscape of courts, and two, because it relies on accounts of actors that may skirt bolder claims about physical presence of law made by materializing approach and avoid this categorical collapse, also referenced by Christopher Tomlins. It's much purer material fragment of the law than a piece of barbed wire, hedge, or piece of shipwreck, and so paper is paper, it's clearly material, and it may explore law's materiality from inside itself on its own terms. Cornelia Visman, a remarkable, you know, remarkable monograph, Files, Law, and Media Technology, published in 2008, remarkable according to Tom Johnson, she shows that files are condensed acts into writing and shape the positivist tendencies of the discipline of academic history to legal history throughout the 19th and 20th century, and cultural logic to files and filing has shaped the form of law. So not only is law manifested in texts, but the texts actually have shaped the law itself and the way these files are done, this filing process is done. For example, it started off from a chancery to the copy and cancel document, who copied and canceled documents in late antiquity, to the public archives in the 19th century. So there's also been this um, expansion to, uh, to the use of more broader public. It, he also contrasts the variety of courtrooms, for example, in the 13th century common law courts, where a small group of men in Westminster Hall specialized in Anglo-Norman French. That's actually something I didn't know before reading this. They actually had their own almost distinct language. To the Episcopal constitution, constitutions held in porches or vestibules of cathedrals. So nonetheless, by looking at these texts, whereas, for example, the former courts were closed off that the public couldn't see, and the latter courts were held off in public places. By looking at the text, it kind of gives them almost an equal status, although there was likely different structural biases in how the texts were performed, at least they can be analyzed in a, a, a fair material playing field. And therefore, in medieval legal proverb, quad non est, in actus non est mundo, so what is not documents is not in the world, he applies the double negative that the real world is found in files. For example, in medieval England, during the Black Death, it was favorable for property tenures. Um, there were, during the Black Death, there were more favorable property tenures because people were dying, so they weren't buying as much land, so they demanded a copyhold as evidence of these favorable terms. And therefore, these were publicly distributed and therefore became real. But if they only were, if they were not given to the people themselves, they might have been not real and tangible, or they could have been changed behind closed doors. Therefore, it's not just law and society, quite, um, but uh, um, uh, two people to reference here, Catherine L. Fisk um, and Angela Fernandez, where the former, um, these are two chapters I previously covered, where the former covered legal history as legal uh, texts, or pardon me, Angela Fernandez covered legal history as legal texts, but Catherine L. L. Fisk is also an expert on legal texts as well but they also explain the legal developments within law and jurisprudence. Elaine Protage and Brad Sherman, in the development of history of modern patent law in the 18th century onwards, said that patent mo models were jurisprudent engines on which figuratively patent law itself was made. So there's this, once again, this recursive effect between the text and the law itself. And once again, it's material and it's easy to categorize because if it's, if it's not on paper, it's clearly not material. And there are a group of related approaches to understand the relationship between law and materiality offers 
most promising avenue for the further research and can show how in, uh, interface between law and its substantiation can form a central system systemic in both its um, its intellectual development and its role in society therefore future histories of medieval law crime and forensics as well as private and environmental law must consider the relationship closely and therefore less technical wider areas from contracts to testaments both popularly imagined as authoritative pieces of paper so there's kind of paper in all aspects of law too so it's not we don't it's unlike uh, categorizing for example what works in some areas and what doesn't work in some areas to focusing on text or filing i think actually that's about yeah it, the filing is the most important thing the process in which they are filed is where the opportunity for legal history is and therefore he notes in um, however some notes of caution for this filing approach and that the line between critical analysis of the performance of law and merely descriptive accounts of past practice may prove too thin so what how do we weigh which texts or which filing approaches are more important and therefore um, is it, it or also will it be strictly merely uh, uh, descriptive rather than critical there because there are no particular methods or ways of finding which are the best filing approaches as of yet and therefore we have to show how the gavels wigs and robes were fragments of apparatus of law with bearings on the legal proceedings or development so that's just an uh, example he says that like how were these actually affecting legal proceedings so it must perhaps not be too descriptive and then a second note of caution is that straining to make law out of assembly of material things may prematurely reify law and therefore the same trap of categorizing and does not explain anything extra so if we only focus on this filing approach we might miss some important things which was an issue with categorizing perhaps a potage says points out the radical potential of this approach and its capacity to rediscover or reconstruct law in circumstances where it might seem to have disappeared so by focusing on this file approach as well he and tomlins have seen in Foucault's dispo dispotiefs the possibility of an approach that postpones law in the analysis while working carefully towards it and perhaps beginning of a new avenue of historical legal research so although there are some issues with filing there seem to be lots of the benefits and uh, i think as christopher tallmans who has one of the editors of the oxford handbook of legal history he's aware of uh, so much in the area of legal history if he gives it his endorsement i think it's it's pretty uh, uh, quite significant merit so moving to the conclusion he says the material turn at its core has two main insights for legal historians one materialists uh, materialism is a construct a realm of action that humans have invented and therefore it's possible to subject construct and interaction with law to critique so it's it's a it's it's a human construction so it's not perfect and therefore there's also different definitions as we saw in the discussion of legal realism as well and therefore the, and the second insight is that his, the historical phenomenon of law has itself been constituted by material things which is, as we saw, particularly in the focus of filing. And therefore, depending on, on the scope of, analy of analytical net, just considered legal or physical world can grow or shrink, moving into categorizing. And therefore, the, the tactics of categorizing material and filing and many others have begun to address these insights. At least one hopefully emerges from Foucault's dispartifs in that the enunciations that emerge in their composition from disparate elements as a practical tool refiguring law as a temporary condition created from certain assemblages rather than an analytic object in historical analysis. So I think he's, well, I think it's clear that he's re referring to filing here, but once again, we're not focusing on categorizing filings. We're not defining what is a legal document and what is not a legal document but rather focusing on the history of how the filing process went about altogether and 
therefore it is a, um, a, a enunciating that emerge in composition from disparate elements as a practical tool figuring law as a temporary condition created from certain assemblages and therefore the material turn as an apparatus no longer in its infancy he says and therefore the initial shock of the radical assertions proceeded to leave productive space for secondary order studies. Therefore, the author sees the critical study of materiality as a stress test for operating assumptions about what the law is and has been in past societies, and, may be rad and he says it may be radically naive question about uh, the nature of the physical world and the composition of law may not yield new answers, but at least lead, it will lead to new questions. And ultimately, the material turn will be judged on whether it creates something beyond itself. And he believes it has potential to do this. And and uh, binding, and he says, binding so faisal an object as law, we will soon find cracks and fractures that open up new materials for research. So that is the chapter on the material turn. I think it's a very... I think it's a complicated subject, but I think, I hope I, I covered it as well as I could. There's, I think, a lot of opportunities available, that particularly in filing, but the point here is that there are three approaches and they all do have merit, but the studying the history of materiality itself is something of great interest, and ultimately it will be judged on the new opportunities it leads to as well. So I think he thinks has a Sort of a positive outlook that there will be much more work in this and perhaps maybe he'll have another article in a few years from now and there'll be another new approach even beyond filing that or another approach to the material turn as it applies to legal history so that is the chapter and biography of tom johnson i'll briefly go through the uh, his slide here and the content and then we'll talk more about him in the comparison with christopher tollins so his institution is the university of york his position is senior lecturer in late medieval history. In terms of the low images, uh, shields we have here is the Cambridge University, where he received his bachelor's, Oxford University, where he received his master's, Burbeck University of London, where he received his PhD, and the University of York, where he is currently a professor. His areas of interest include law, governments and authority, church, courts and ecclesiastical institutions, news information and rumor material culture and materiality suggested readings include news and networks a culture publishing a cultural history of media in the middle Egypt ages uh, 500 to 1450 the editor was signs seen published by bloomsbury publishing 2021 so that was an article he wrote a book he wrote that was law in common legal cultures in late medieval england published by the Oxford University Press in 2019. And another article he wrote that I suggest reading is The Economics of Shipwrecks in Late Medieval East Anglia, published in the Custom and Commercialization in English Rural Society, revisiting Tawny and Poston uh, with Bowen J and Brown A as editors, published by the University of Hertfordshire Press in 2016. As for the quotes, the material turn in the humanities seems to fit with broader trends in contemporary society. Its focus in the power of the material world seems highly fitting in the era of the burgeoning environmental destruction. Its terminology of networks and flows seems opposite from the information age, and its destruction of the categorical division between humans and objects mirrors the breaking down of these boundaries in bioengineering. Next quote, the material turn as a theoretical apparatus is no longer in its infancy, but as, as is the way so often with scholarly trends, the initial shock of its dramatic assertions has receded to leave a productive space in which second order studies can flourish. And last, third and last quote, ultimately the material turn will be judged on whether it creates something beyond itself. So I hope you found that chapter as fascinating as I did myself and another way that you can approach or think about legal history specifically in reference to the material term and with particularly note of the three approaches he mentioned. So once again, his chapter is chapter 26, Legal History and the Material Term in part three, Perspectives, Legal History and Modern Legal Thought by Tom Johnson. So moving to the chapter and biography by Christopher Tomlin. So this is a very, very important one 
by one of the editors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, alongside Marcus D. Dubber. So, uh, sorry, I'll get on to the title as well. Okay. okay. So, as per his biography, he is the Christopher Tomlins is the Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. And I think a brief thing to note is that often Berkeley Law was previously called Berk, uh, Bolt Hall, named after John Bolt, but they had room, who was a famous Oklahoma attorney. However, they have since removed the name Bolt Hall in 2020 because due to John Bolt being uh, found a racist. However, Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt has not been found a racist, so Christopher Tollins can keep the same professor name, and it's also, I think, a very one of the most important titles at the university. He joined the Berkeley Law faculty in 2014. He began his teaching career at La Trobe University in Melbourne in 1980 as a lecturer, advancing to a senior lecturer, and then he proceeded to the university, uh, university reader in legal studies as well. In 1992 to 2002, he was on the faculty of the American Bar Foundation of Chicago, and in 2009, he, uh, he was the Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine. His primary affiliation at Berkeley is to the Jurisprudence and Social Policy PhD program, where he teaches courses in legal history and the history of law in, and slavery. He also teaches in undergraduate legal studies program. As per his uh, education, he received his Bachelor of Arts from Oxford University in 1973 in politics, philosophy, and economics. As well, he received his Master's of Arts from the University of Sussex in 1974 in American Studies. And in, in 1977, he received his Master of Arts from Oxford in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. And in 1977, he received his Master of Arts in History from the John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University. And in 1981, he received his PhD from the Johns Hopkins University in 1981 in the United States. His books include In the Matter of Nat Turner, A Speculative History, published by the Princeton University Press in 2020, Freedom Bound, Law, Labor, and Civic Identity in Colonizing English America, 1580 to 1865, published in 2010 by the Cambridge University Press, which has won many awards. One of such was the John Philip Reed Prize in America from the American Society of Legal History, his best book published in the field of legal history in 2010, so pretty big. Uh, this book has many other awards as well, too. Law, his other book, Law, Labor, and Ideology in the Early American Republic, published by the Cambridge University Press in 1993. And his next book is researching the American modernist writer and historian John Dos Passos, who lived from 1896 to 1970, so... Also, while we don't yet have a title for that, I encourage you to look out for it, as I will be myself. His areas of expertise include critical legal theory, employment and labor law, jurisprudence, law and society, and legal history. Yep. So, moving to his chapter, titled Marxist Legal History. It is chapter 28 of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, and it is in part three, Perspectives, Legal History in Modern Legal Thought. So he notes... Marxism is not about to disappear as an attractive ideology or as a powerful political force in the world. According to the American legal history, William E. Nelson in 1985, and he'll be referenced later as well. However, this was uh, perhaps rash as the world has decisively gone against communist parties and the social socialist bloc for their inability to recover from the 1980s recession and the Soviet entrapment in Afghanistan. So since so even at this time in the 19, um, when in 1985, when William E. Nelson wrote this, he seemed to be uh, perhaps wrong because there seemed to be a movement away from Marxism. But perhaps Christopher Tomlin's notes he meant the academic world. There's um, that Marxism will not disappear. <coughs> Pardon me. According to Susan Easton in Western Garb, the high point in the 1970s and 1980s 
there's a shift from the radical movements to the academy. So there have been a shift from these, perhaps the political side to the academic side of Marxism, and in, particularly in Western Marxism, according to Susan Easton. And therefore, the more rigid and scholastic, and down um, there, and there's been an own deepening theoretical crisis, perhaps as well. Nelson notes, I expect the neo-Marxist legal history to continue to flourish. However, there is no in situ neo-Marxist school, perhaps even out of, if there is, it's even out of date. So where is this Marxism that Nelson is referring to if it is not in the political side? And there is no specific neo-Marxist or Marxist school in the education systems right now. In an exchange between Nelson and Robert W. Gordon, the neo-Marxist theory they said was was evidence to be equivalent to critical legal studies, so perhaps it is there, where the former said it is a trivial repetition of realist slash instrumentalist contention that power is not, not law determines the outcome of legal institutions. Therefore, a neo-Marxist theory is a, perhaps even a challenge to law. So neo-Marxist theory perhaps is critical legal studies in that it is perhaps driven largely by power, but not necessarily um, self-contained. Gordon clarified, however, there was a difference in that critical legal studies, people identify themselves as on the left, but the left means itself means Marxism, so a slightly different definition here. But Marxism means as a vulgar instrumentalist view of law, and few Marxists uh, are the vulgar instrumentalists noted but not, but is, um, so there are some vulgar Marxist instrumentalists, but it's uh, not his purpose to discuss them. Most critical legal studies historians are extremely critical of orthodox Marxist historiography, and still more to learn from critical legal studies history. So if these critical legal studies historians are critical of Marxism, how can they be the same thing? Morton Horowitz's Transformation of American Law in 1977 this is, um, was a, this is a, a very significant book in Marxist legal history. It was, it was the question, it was it anti-Marxist, was it Marxist or neo-Marxist, but it was ultimately defined as neo-Marxist. So this would be an important book if one would to be interested in where neo-Marxist scholarship is, and particularly if we want to manifest most clearly the differences between neo-Marxist studies and critical legal studies, perhaps a side-by-side -side comparison between this and some lead leading CLS or critical legal studies works. The history of the Anglophone Academy, is, he says, is a history in part of its absence, however. At this moment, what opportunities exist for an attempt to renew Marxist legal history? and what responsibilities attend this effort. And this will be the purpose of this chapter. So this is, uh, I think, a very um, challenging topic Christopher Thomas took because he probably he knows so much about legal history, but he particularly chose to write the chapter on something that does not seem to exist, particularly on the political side, but also maybe even in the academic side. So moving to chapter section one, the requisite Prelogomenon, Marx and Engels on law. So he says, every count of the place of law without exception in the work of Marx and Engels, nowhere is law made a direct object of subject of study. Therefore, Marx's theory of law is necessarily a work of extrapolation and interpretation using fragmentary sources in extensive corpus of writing that are often, or that are all not consistent with one another. So even if, let's say, there is this Marxist theory, history, which perhaps there likely is, there it's all from extrapolation because Marx and Engels did not re specifically refer to it. There are certain texts that loom larger than others, however, in this body of work, and in the spirit of the conjugal Ridur I Principia, we'll visit only two one extremely prominent and one relatively obscure. So going into some specific legal history here, we'll go cover two works by Marx and Engels, respectively, that being 
one extremely prominent and one relatively obscure to see what really is market Marxist uh, le legal history. So part A of section one, preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy published by in 1859. So first he says comes the best known, the perennially analyzed, the most austerely structural, the text G.A. Cohen identifies as Marxism's Euro text, the original or earliest to compare later versions, which is a contribution to the critique of political economy. Marx in this work summarizes the essential conclusion reached in the course of my study of political economy in the matter of social determination of human existence and consciousness. In the proposition from the passage conclusion, Marx would not disagree. Um, so that he gives um, uh, text from this piece of work in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. I cannot read it out because they're rather long and also I think that would be an issue with plagiarism. But the main takeaway from this is he says that Marx would likely not disagree with the proposition that legal property relations constitute the economic structure of society or the real foundation. Therefore, the e equilibrium is not static. The materialist forces, or the tools, raw materials, population characteristics, develop over time. And an era of social revolution is when people become conscious of a conflict between material, productive forces and prevailing with property relations. Therefore, gains expression in all ideological forms, legal, political, religious, artistic, and philosophic. So it's not strictly legal, but there's these revolutions are drawn when there's a difference between the pro uh, property re uh, relations and the social consciousness. Uh, bet between, pardon me, material productive forces and prevailing property relations. And therefore, it's fought out in the superstructure. And the clock ticks, he says, as the relations of product production cease to accommodate social forces of production and therefore moves away from an equilibrium, according to Marx, or according to Christopher Tomlin's reading of this work of Marx. And therefore, in the preface of Mar Marx, led from, he says that Marx, or Marx says that he was led from his career in jurisprudence to the study of political economy because he found himself in the embarrassing position of having to discuss what is known as material interests. And so law was not sufficient to discuss political economy. And therefore the incapacity of jurisprudence alone to explain the course of legal and political debates. On the contrary, not legal relations uh, on the, all right, not, and not political forms, but instead general development of mind the mind originates in the material conditions of life. It might be, uh, the, it originates in, however, it is not necessarily determined by the material conditions of life. Instead, it is determined by what Hegel, is, by Hegel's definition following the 18th century English and French thinkers, that civil society is determined by political economy and material life conditions and the general processes of social, political, and intellectual life, legal relations, and the political forms constitute relations of production. So it's a, it's a, a, a factor, but it is not necessarily the absolute cause. He next moves to the work by Frederick, uh, a lesser known work by Frederick Egels in an, a letter to Walter Borgias on the 25th of January, 1894, near the end of Engel's life, where, and he responded to Walter Borgias, an economist, who asked Engels for what he meant by the economic conditions. And his response was broad, basic, and discriminating, like in the 1859 preface, in that it meant two things. Firstly, the economic conditions are described as the determining basis of the history of society, not a particular society, as well any given society at any stage of development. So these are sort of, uh, ec so economic conditions are not specific to a country, but and they're 
regardless of a system, resources, technology, etc., or as well government systems such as tribal or feudal. And they're also descriptive, not determinative, and therefore they're autonomous, substrate, or structural. And there's still inter inter indications, and they're the last instance reasoning. So they can be sort of defined retroactively, but by looking at a specific country's social conditions, you cannot assume what might happen in law, politics, etc. And however, they are influenced by political ideological causes, they are ultimately a decisive factor. So they are somewhat independent as well, but not fully autonomous. So these are all very, very complex topics, and I, um, I urge you and as well myself to read more, but the point here, as we'll see as moving forward, is how what we're trying to do here is to document the history of Marxism and essentially through these two texts we have an implication on law and basically this is a work itself in legal history because we're studying two works and extrapolating the takeaways in terms of law. So moving to section two on the singularities of the English. So now moving to the to some English analysis. So that was previously perhaps an, uh, an analysis specifically done by Christopher Tomlins by on works by uh, Marx and Engels, and now moving to a history on the Eng in England. He says the most famous legal historical statement about law by any Anglo Marxist was from Edward Paul Thompson in 1977, published in Whigs and Hunters. And he said, law was anything but autonomous and relative to economy and society. He said, the greatest of all legal fictions is that law evolves from case to case by its own impartial logic, true only in its own integrity, unswayed by expedient considerations. And But he later took a almost full U-turn and he said, because he feared the abuse of the elites, that it was also transcendentally an unqualified human good, and therefore a refute of structuralist Marxism. So what was happening here in this uh, English singularity, as Christopher Tomlins calls it, is this leading uh, scholar named Edward Paul Thompson said that law was not at all autonomous and caused by outside forces. But he feared, however, that if this were true, there and it would be subject to abuse. So then he took a U-turn and said that perhaps there was um, some unqualified human good of law and that it is somewhat, um, somewhat autonomous and therefore refuting the structuralist Marxists, Marxism. Structuralist Marxists such as Louis Althusser still noted that, but so then, uh, uh, Edward Paul Thompson started critiquing many of these structuralist economists, uh, Marxists, such as Althusser, uh, but even these structuralist Marxists still believed that there was a relative autonomy, and they and it was destroyed the orthodoxies himself destroyed orthodoxies economic determinism. So Thompson, the singularity was that Thompson believed or seemed to indicate that he was finding something new, but really was just kind of repeating the structuralist Marxists from across the ocean, across the channel, and specifically Althusser in France. Nicola, Nic Nikos Poulantes, Poulantes expanded as well on Althusser's relative autonomy critique of Marxist reductionist theories of state. So even these structuralist Marxists did not believe in um, zero autonomy. They also saw an autonomy of law, and therefore Thompson was really just reviving Marxism in England in 1977. Thompson therefore broadly represented structuralists as incapable of distinguishing between arbitrary power and the rule of law, but he was unfairly painting the picture, and therefore an attempt to dilute instrumentalist message of its substance with a discussion of the hegemonic influence of law. So he said that they were trying to make it a, a, a abuse of power, essentially. And it, it was an ad hominem attacks he used. He even used 
or for a Stalinist as well, as well. Um, there might have been some conflict between Europe, specifically Paris and England, to divide. Martin Krieger said, what took him so long to leave Marxism? So ultimately, even uh, uh, the, Thompson took almost a full U-turn, uh, almost completely moved away from it as well. Perry Anderson, Barry Nindes, Hindes, Paul Hurst also debated with Thompson, but Thompson was ultimately the most influential. But really what, 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 this, what Christopher Thompson is showing here is part of the history of, the, the history of Marxism. And it was that there was this, uh, according to his analysis in the legal text by Marx and Engels, there is this Marxism that is uh, where law is a constituent part, but also there is also these specifically these economic conditions, which are one of the leading causes, but it's also very multifaceted. But then later in England, or later in France, which isn't necessarily covered, but Althusser has this, uh, advocates for these uh, political forces, but does mention the relative autonomy of law. And then later, uh, Thompson brings this in England uh, under the guise that he found it by himself, but really he is much, in many ways, restating the work of Althusser. But so nonetheless, this is how sort of Marxism has had maintained up until the 1970s, the late 1970s, back from 1859 or even earlier through the work of Marx and Engels. Moving to the uh, next section, uh, part three, the three comings of Evan G. Evgeny Pashukunkanis. Um, so he says, Edward Thompson's blunderous assault on all through Althusserianism was one more laugh line, but and it coincided, however, with a second major event in the mid 1970s, where Western, for Western Marxism, where there was the recovery from the relatively obscurity, obscurity, of the commodity form theory of law first developed in the 1920s by Evan G. Evgeny Pash, Pashukanis. So there was also this. So there was, on one hand. Marxism was brought back to, or brought, or kind of restored, or kind of re requalified in England in 1977. But at the same time, there was the revival of the commodity form theory founded by Pashukanis in the 1920s. So briefly about Pashukanis, he lived from uh, Ev Evgeny Pashukanis. He lived from 1891 to 1937. And he was, for 13 years, he was the single most important figure in the social legal life. His, the general theory of law and Marxism ensured his preeminence in the field. However, in 1937, he was declared a counter-revolutionary by Andrei Vyshekinsky, and he was shot. And according to Michael Head, there was the, he, they, the potentially struggle, they potentially strangled his potential was strangled by the needs of the Stalinist regime so I think this is an important note in that Marxism does differ from Stalinism, Stalinism and perhaps communism and in the 19, um, 1937 he was killed and but as we see there was a revival of him later in the 1970s uh, it was he was recognized in the West however but Gramsci and later Althusser already simulated widespread interest in the ideology of state and law, and it was rediscovered in the mid-1970s. So even uh, Althusser and Gramsci, who were two leading Marxists in, the, uh, the, in, May, in the continental Europe, they didn't really make specific references to Pashukani, Pashukanis, pardon me, it's a difficult name for me, but I'm getting it. Um, but nonetheless, it was revived in the 1970s. The wave was led by Chris Arthur in the United Kingdom and Isaac Bulbas in the United States. The former, Chris Arthur, said the only real that Pash Pashukanis was the only real and original contributor to a materialist philosophy of law. And he identified three fundamental emphases of his work. 
One law was an historic form which achieves its full ex expression in the bourgeois epoch. Two law was tied to the commodity economy. A necessary condition of commodity exchange was the participation of legal subjects routinely endowed with rights to possess and exchange its objects. And three, the bourgeois law had no pr proletarian afterlife. Um, and Thomson specifically scorned the third point. Furthermore, the third point followed the necessity of the first two, that the form of law corresponded in structure to the form of the bourgeois commodity exchange, the proletarian revolution would end. And Arthur quoted the, the general theory extensively. So Arthur in the United Kingdom brought back Pashukanis, and it's clear that Pashukanis, well, outwardly a Marxist, was also a legal scholar as well. So that is the legal component of the Marxist legal history. And then there's Isaac Bulbus in the United States, too, in his commentary on the general theory, attempted to develop a Marxist theory with it because he had a dissatisfaction with the instrumentalist and reductionist arguments. He said, after working out homology between commodity and legal form, and legal form he found Pashukanis developed essentially the same analysis 50 years ago. He argued the formalist and structuralist applied the same logic and Marxist legal theory refuted or overcame both. He thought it was Marxism was not autonomous or strictly controlled by only the powerful, but he had no reference to Althusser or Gramsci. Furthermore, it was structuralist, but he, he, um, we could see Pashkanis as well, Bulbus, were not structuralists, but essentialists. But he declared cryptically that his goal was to re re reunify structure and history. He did not have obvious interest, however, in Marxist legal history, but nonetheless, he brought Marx Marxist legal history to the United States or to the Anglophone world more generally. But specifically, it's not just Marxism, but also with a large focus on law as well. But these are ideas all the way back from 1920 from Pashu Kanis, who also derived his legal interpretations from Marx and Engels, who were many years further. So, but it's almost, you know, we're getting into, well, it's all evidently kind of secondhand, but I could, I might put it in, a, in one way because we have Pashu Kanis interpreting Marx and Engels, and then we have Arthur and Bulbas interpreting Pashukanis or, but I guess Bulbas in some ways found the same conclusions independently of Pashukanis, but he was right in that, in, in giving credit to Pashukanis for having found it earlier. Four years after 1977, there was a resurgence of Marxist theory of law with a peak in 1981. So these, these trends specifically Thompson, uh, Bulbas, and Arthur brought back Marxist legal theory history, and it grew and it peaked in 1981, but then it quickly fell off as quickly as it came on. The theoret with theoretical concerns with Marxism generally, and structural determinism was being replaced by the irreducible, irreducibly contingent. There was also new identity-based social movements captured more attention as well as the collapse of communism by the end of the 1980s, there were few wandering in the rubble. So once again, Marxist legal history and Marxism generally fell out of popularity. And there was, however, he notes, there was to be a third coming of Pashukanis and a new chance for Marxist legal history. So moving to the last section before the conclusion of the current conjecture. He says, we live in un uncertain times, he notes, right-wing rupture with neoliberalism puts old sectors such as durable manufacturing, fossil energy, agribusiness, construction against the new, such as technology, information, renewable energy, and social media. At the extremes, capital's civil war offers a choice between anarcho-capitalism and possibility of a resurgent fascism, so globalism and nationalism. There's the old loyalists are now departed and dead. So there are 
now it's up to new interpreters largely. The most serious problem is not an intellectual but political. Not a lack of imagination or rigor, but lack of active working class social movement to inform and discipline the theoretical and imperial work of Marxist intelligentsia. So it's perhaps there's a separation between the intelligentsia and the political forces. Therefore, Marxism has been revitalized as well in international law. So on one hand, it's being re revitalized through this rupture between the two wings, but it's also being revitalized in international law, such as Costas Duzinas, but he also notes there are some, there's some irony in this as well, um, such as Costas Duzinas, he says, wherever proliferation of theory, uh, something certainly, wherever there's a proliferation of theory, something certainly has gone wrong. So as we see here, if there's a proliferation again of Marxist legal uh, theory, there, something is probably going wrong in the global sphere. So in so some examples of Marxism res, res, res coming back in the international law is the international law of the left, re-examining Marxist legacies, edited by Susan Marx, Marx with a K. It was originally published in the Leiden Journal of International Law, I'm pretty close to Leiden, city right now in the Netherlands in 2008, as well Between Equal Rights, a Marxist Theory of Law, published in 2005 by China Miaville, and as well where he uses references the Iraq War and references to Pushkanis, so there are references again to the Marxist ideas and specifically Pushkanis as well. But nonetheless, these are coming back into popularity because there's a rupture between uh, the old, the old business and the new businesses, as Christopher Tomlins observes. But the, I think what he means by the irony that is coming in the international law field is that it's, it's uh, in some ways, it's that it closes. It, it the international law field is supposed to globalize and bring people together. But the way some of these approaches are being done is that it's becoming a divisive factor. So moving to the conclusion, he says Marxism never more than a fringe presence in legal history. So as we kind of tracked, I hope I covered it as well as possible, the history of Marxist legal history, it's never been a but a fringe presence in legal history, even in the peak in 1981, it, because it has been her, heterogeneous, and according to Ellen Woods, and it's indifferent to grand narratives, structure, and process. There's a the critique of capitalism, which is um, ubiquitous, has faded into the background. So one thing that, so these Marxist legal histories are, they're so different and they're heterogeneous as we see. And the only thing they have in common is that they critique capitalism, but capitalism has become so ubiquitous. And in the background, in effect, Marxist legal history has as well. As well, the resurgence of capitalism and history, however, now, may find new unexpected Marxist allies. So as Mar capitalism comes back into popularity, as we've seen with capitalist legal history is becoming popular as well, they find may find new allies with Marxist legal historians. So that's, I think, one of the key takeaways here is they don't need to be opposed. They can be supplementary or complementary to each other. What makes Marxist legal history useful less that produces specific outcomes but that it's an explicitly historical method, so it shouldn't be political, necessarily. He says, we should shun the four horsemen, dogma, secretarianism, excessive extraction, and political correctness. So I think so a lot of people by political correctness, they maybe don't want to talk about this topic, and that's why I think it's, it's important that Christopher Tomlins took this difficult topic, because um, I think many, I think, newer scholars or less experienced scholars wouldn't be able to tackle this and he says also one must be generous plural and imaginative imaginative instead of these four horsemen he then re returns to a quote from william e nelson who had the quote at the beginning who said that some of the previous quote if one had forgotten was that legal history uh, pardon me marxism still exists but then we're like, where is it? It's not in the political, perhaps it's in the academic. So he moves to this quote that he watched in the 
immediately following the 2008 crash in a speech to Harvard Law School. He says, wishing Morton Horowitz a happy retirement, he said, we need to know Marxist materialism no longer has significant political force. And therefore, if it doesn't have a significant political force, I think it's the conclusion here is that it is safe in academia. What more could possibly guarantee a revival at this moment than another of Bill's effable predictions? So he perhaps has another prediction that Marxism might return, but in it, perhaps if it's done, it must be done in the right way in academia. But maybe, um, yeah, but not, ex not to never have political conclusions, but basically the, the focus shouldn't be on political conclusions. Therefore, and um, a little bit about who uh, Morton Horowitz was. So Morton Horowitz, who was retiring at the time, he was the dean of Harvard Law School and a professor and uh, um, American legal historian as well. So that is the chapter by Christopher Tollins. That is uh, it's one of the longest chapters as well in the, chap in the whole Oxford Handbook of Legal History. And as well, his influence has been throughout, even as we saw in the chapter previously by Tom Johnson. He references some of Christopher Tollins' work. So we'll talk about the, discuss the slide we have here, and then we'll talk a bit more about Christopher Tolman's in the comparison. So the institution he's at is the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. His position is the Elizabeth Jocelyn Bolt Professor of Law. Suggested reader, readings in the matter of Nat Turner, A Speculative History, by, published by the Princeton University Press in 2020. Searching for Contemporary Legal Thought, where De Soltes Stein J, who will be one of the other, who's an uh, author in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, I believe in the next chapter we'll be covering, and Christopher Tomlins, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2017, and his award-winning book, Freedom Bound, Law, Labor, and Civic Identity in Colonizing English America, 1580 to 1865, Cambridge University Press in 2010, 2010, pardon me. Um, and many also previous legal historians in the Oxford Handbook have also referenced this book as well, as well as Christopher Tomlin's generally. His areas of expertise include critical legal theory, employment and labor law, jurisprudence, law and society, and legal history. The logos, we have the University of Oxford, where he received his Bachelor of Arts in PP&E, Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. To, to the left of that, we have the University of Sussex, where he received his Master's of Arts in American Studies. Uh, about that, we have the, uh, he also did in between this, he also did a Master's as well after the University of Sussex again at the uh, University of Oxford in Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. In the top right, we have the University Johns Hopkins University, where he received his PhD in History. And to the left of that, we have the University of California, uh, University of California, Berkeley, where he's currently a professor at the University of, uh, at the Berkeley School of Law. He also note that he also did, was a professor for a time at the University of California, Irvine. In terms of the quotes, we have this brief history of the maturation of legal history in the Anglophone academia. Then is in part the history of its absence. Next quote. Precisely because no guiding determinative text exists, developing a Marxist theory of law is necessarily a work of extrapolation and interpretation undertaken post hoc using fragmentary, source, fragmentary sources within an extensive corpus of writing that are not consistent with another. So essentially it is a form of extrapolation and interpretation and even secondary uh, research. At its extremes, capital's civil war offers us a chance between anarcho-capitalism and the possibility of resurgent fascism. So a reason why we don't want to have too much of a political approach. The primordial landscape of Western Marxism, this is the next quote, is being rejuvenated by work in international law. There is considerable irony in this. And that is because perhaps it is a divisive factor rather than a uniting factor. And then let us shun the four horsemen, dogma, secretarianism, excessive abstraction, and political correctness. Let us be generous, plural, and imaginative instead. So spirit of research. And I think that's something that is manifested seeing the, the camaraderie between all the authors in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, which is something that I'm certain Christopher Thomas, as well as Marcus D. Dubber, the editor, have facilitated. 
or caused even. And once again, his chapter is in part three, Perspectives, Legal History and Modern Legal Thought, and it is chapter eight, Marxist Legal History. So moving to the comparison and the style of Plutarch's lives. So on one hand, so Tom Johnson uh, did his bachelor at Cambridge, whereas Christopher Tomlins did his bachelor's in Oxford. And there are, I think, more similar than most other institutions. So I think that's quite similar in terms of their first degree. However, Tom Johnson went to Burbank University for his PhD and currently teaches at the University of York, which are all in the United Kingdom. Whereas Christopher Tomlins um, studied at the University of Sussex American Studies, so he started to get perhaps an interest in American Studies, and then he went to, to the United States wholly in, to receive his PhD at Johns Hopkins University and is currently teaching at Berkeley School of Law, the University of California in the United States. So he has shifted to the United States, whereas Thompson, Tom Johnson has remained for all of his uh, academic career in the United Kingdom or at least uh, he did do, um, he has spent time abroad, but for his large movements have been mostly primarily in the United Kingdom. In terms of their, they both have a PhD, so some legal historians don't have PhDs, or, but so both of them do have PhDs, whereas Christopher Tomlins is specifically a PhD in history, whereas Tom Johnson, I'm not, it, I could not see his, find his CV online, but his thesis was on law and history, so similarities there. Tom Johnson has primarily articles, and he is the co-author of one book, whereas Christopher Tomlins has multiple books, and he has one award-winning. However, it must be noted that Christopher Tomlins is a more senior academic, so there's not to say Tom Johnson won't produce many more books and perhaps win many awards as well. They, um, on one hand, in terms of their contribution to the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, it might be noted that Tom Johnson is a contributor and author of a chapter, whereas a Christopher Tomlins, as well as Marcus C. Dubber, is a definitive leader in the textbook, and he is referenced in almost every chapter and had his influence there, so somewhat of a, a, a larger contribution, but who say that Tom Johnson might not do something similar in the future as well. They both, I think, for the, both their chapters, they did, Tom Johnson was, does have a specific interest in uh, materialism, but I think he's also even perhaps more, or he's also particularly fascinated in medieval legal history. So it is somewhat, um, uh, well, it's uh, I, maybe they're 50-50, I'm not sure, but it is, it is one of his interests, but he also incorporated medieval legal history in it itself. But nonetheless, it is one of his key areas of interest that he wrote about in this section. Whereas Christopher Tomlins wrote about Marxist legal history, but he's primarily focused in, on American legal history, as best perhaps or most notably manifested in Freedom Bound, his award-winning book. So Marxist legal history is not, it's not something that I see him teaching particular courses on or writing specific books on, but I think that's why I think it was important that he wrote it because he has so much experience and as we've seen that Marxism has always been a sort of a the, uh, never more than a fringe presence in legal history. And I, I think it's important that a leader of the textbook took a fringe topic to write so extensively on one of the long, longest chapters as well. So I think he gave it credibility as well. Um, and I think they both have a positive approach. They both talk about new opportunities in both of these, both their areas, mater the material turn and Marxist legal st history, respectively. So they both have a positive approach. They're not saying, oh, this is this is done. Don't know, need to research it. So I think that's good. And I think it makes it exciting to read about the future opportunities. And I think they both also have a very international perspective. They both covered them in terms of their history, talking about multiple different geographies, but also its implications on the world as a whole. But in common to both them specifically and all the others in the Oxford Handbook of his Legal History, but not true of all lawyers and not true of all people, is that they both distinctly have a fascination in legal history. And that is something I do too, and that's something why that's these two are individuals who have inspired me to pursue this type of research and work and reading and speaking so and i've enjoyed it much so thank you so much for watching and thank you also to the, both these authors for producing this great piece of work
that people like me and you can learn from. So I hope you enjoy and continue to support. Thank you so much.